In World War II, submarines were built for a game of stealth, nerves, and lethal precision. But what happened when the vessel the crews trust with their lives is a death trap waiting to happen. At number 6, the Type D submarine is technically the best on our list, but it was still a strategic dead end. It was an industrial admission of defeat, building submarines solely to haul rice and ammo for isolated island garrisons. Hydrodynamically, the Type D submarine was a disaster. The blocky hull sacrificed diving speed and depths, but needed to maximize cargo hold. It was a cold, calculated industrial trade-off to mass-produce these underwater barges quickly. Powered by obsolescent camp and diesels, these boats were noisy and sluggish. But they were reliable workhorses. With a staggering 15,000 nautical mile range, meant these mills could theoretically cross the Pacific. Submarine life is always difficult, but the Type D was among the worst. Sleeping atop aviation fuel and ammunition in unventilated tropical waters created a psychological nightmare among the crews. With a pitiful 13-knot surface speed, the Type D was practically stationary against anti-submarine warfare in 1944. It couldn't evade U.S. destroyers fast enough once detected by ASTIC. Economically, spending millions to deliver a paltry 80 tons of cargo per trip is logistical absurdity. But for the starving garrisons on bypassed islands, this was a necessity. The ultimate strategic misuse occurred when the submarine was converted from slow, vulnerable underwater transports into carriers for chitin suicide torpedoes, making it an even more ineffective platform. The Type D was mechanically functional but conceptually useless, yet its very existence proved Japan had already lost. Coming in at number 5 is the Thames River class, which was mechanically problematic and further plagued by doctrinal error. To achieve its high speed, the submarine compromised survivability. The riveted hull was structurally weak, limiting the Thames class to only around 300-foot test step. Its Ricardo supercharged diesels were overly complicated. While they produced massive power, the vibration was so intense it literally shook the board apart. These were the roomiest British subs ever built, but the comfort was a lie. The engines were deafening. At 115 decibels, it was painful and the vibration made sleep impossible. Crews had legroom, but the acoustic torture and psychological stress effectively negated any comfort provided by the extra volume. At 22 knots, they were the hot rods of the 1930s, outpacing almost other submarines. They sacrificed diving agility for a sprint capability that was tactically suicidal in World War II. With only three were built, they were ruinously expensive. They consumed shipyard resources that could have built dozens of T-class boats. As a prestige project, it offered little strategic value when the shooting actually started. Built to screen battleships, they were useless in a radar-dominated ocean. These high-speed submarines were relegated to supply runs to Malta. The Thames class represented the final gasping breath of the fleet's submarine concept of the World War I. Technically impressive, but operationally irrelevant. At number 4, we have the USS Barracuda class. These weren't just bad boats, they were an engineering disaster. Designed to run with battleships, they wound up shaking themselves to pieces. Hydrodynamically, the Barracuda was a brick. At over 2,500 tons of merge, it was a bloated boat that struggled to maintain neutral buoyancy. Its terrifying tendency to broach or pop out of the water unexpectedly. The Bush Solcer diesels were arguably the boat's worst enemy. The direct drive system created torsional vibrations so violent they sheared rivets and shattered battery components. Just like the Thames class, the Barracuda's hull is vibrating like a jackhammer. The crew lived in constant acoustic torture and fear of mechanical self-destruction. The Navy promised 21 knots to screen the battle fleet, but it barely scraped 19. Forced to use a composite propulsion system, they failed in their primary strategic requirement before the war even started. The U.S. Navy poured Depression-era fortunes into these submarines. They were among the most expensive subs of the interwar period, but offered zero operational return during the war. To their credit, U.S. Navy command recognized a turkey when they saw one. Unlike the Japanese who forced bad designs into combat, the Navy wisely yanked the Barracudas from offensive patrols by 1943. The Barracuda class was a necessary failure. It taught American engineers exactly what not to do, paving the way for the successful Gato and Balao classes. Coming in at number 3 is the Soviet Union's Katyusha class. On paper, these were supposedly heavily armed, long-range submarines capable of dominating the seas. 
The double hull design was meant for robustness, but it hid internal rot and shoddy welding from inspection. At nearly 100 meters long, it was a massive target. Reliability of Katyusha class was non-existent. In the Arctic, ballast valves simply froze shut, leaving them stranded on the surface and sitting ducks for the Luftwaffe. Imagine sleeping inside a freezer at minus 30 degrees Celsius, because the heating failed while condensation froze on the walls. This made the K-Class a cold hell for Soviet sailors. Supposedly capable of 22 knots, these boats were sluggish. A 10-knot submerged speed sounds decent, but with a turning circle rivaling a battleship and agonizingly slow dive times, they couldn't dodge attacks. The steel and manpower wasted on these 12 submarines could have produced dozens of smaller, more effective Shuka-class subs. It was a vanity project that drained the Soviet war economy. These submarines were more suited for the warmer Pacific, yet Soviet commands shoved them into the shallow, mine-filled fjords of the Arctic. The lack of agility and restrictive waters made their destruction inevitable. The K-class managed to combine bad design, terrible reliability, and improper deployment. With a near-complete mission failure rate in its intended role as nearly half of the Katyusha submarines lost to accidents and mines. The Maruyu resulted from intense intra-service rivalry. These submarines were built by the Army because they despised the Navy. Designed independently for coastal supply, it was essentially a submersible cargo tank. Built from cheap mild steel by locomotive factories rather than naval yards, its step was dangerously capped at 40 meters. It lacked fundamental safety margins, making it structurally compromised and primitive. With weak engines and poor construction, the boats were persistent logistical liabilities. Many were lost to mechanical failure or weather. The lack of robust naval standards led directly to mission failure. Army crews faced immense stress operating these fragile, unfamiliar vessels. Lacking torpedoes and armed only with a small deck gun, they were defenseless against anti-submarine attacks. Speed was a critical failure of these submarines. Struggling to reach 14 knots surfaced and crawling at a painful 4 knots submerged, it was slower than most convoys. The program was a massive waste of critical resources. Intending to build 400 boats, the Army completed only 38, draining steel and labor from proven naval programs. The Army thrust these flawed transports into desperate combat zones like the Philippines, where they were totally inequipped to survive or succeed. The Maru Yu proved that political rivalry is deadlier than depth charges. Slower than transport ships and terrifyingly fragile, it ignored naval engineering laws, wasting resources on a vessel that had no business underwater. At 4,300 tons, the Sirkorf was one of the world's largest submarines that relied on the ineffective artillery submarine concept. Mounting massive 203mm two, guns and a watertight hangar, these made the vessel dangerously top-heavy. The high center of gravity caused sickening rolls in rough seas, degrading gun accuracy and forcing structural compromises. The complex mechanical seals for the massive gun turret and seaplane hangar took minutes to secure, making the boat dangerously slow to dive. Life aboard was hellish due to the violent rolling motion and the psychological terror of slow dive times. The 118-man crew suffered from overcrowding. Its surface speed was too slow to catch targets, while massive drag ruined maneuverability, making evasion from destroyers impossible. The Surkouf was an expensive industrial project, costing three times as much as a standard submarine for less combat value than a trawler. Too bulky for stealth, it became a political pawn for the Free French. It was forced into patrol roles for which it was criminally unsuited. The Surkouf ranked high as a waste of resources. It combined the cost of a cruiser with the vulnerability of a submarine. It took minutes to dive and had zero utility in the war. Thank you for watching and see you in our next videos.